Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Golf Strong Project. We have got a extremely special guest today who's like the most popular person in Tim and I's life. Or he's the person that we probably follow the most and care about what they do in the socials world. Um, Alex Eller, the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend, the golf physiologist, as he is most commonly known. I didn't know your name for like a long time. <laughs> Who is this guy? Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. Should be fun. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit of shop. As always, Dr. Tim Ravoto up in Bostonian. Yes, sir. Ready to get after it. I'm excited to uh, – we talked about club head speed a couple weeks ago, but I think we're going to get a little deeper into it uh, this week with with the help of uh, Mr. Eller here. Who is the brain of this podcast today, without question. Tim and I are peasants in the world I don't know of, about that just spend, <laughs> just spend way too much time reading about golf probably more than anything it sounds like an awesome job <laughs> yeah it's not bad uh, I, I think that sounds fantastic so yeah we're going to talk uh club head speed today we're going to talk a lot about training principles and what that should look like in golf some of the misconceptions that we see um talk a lot about alex's research he is one of the few people actually doing useful research in the golf world right now and we're going to talk a lot about how there's really not a lot available. Um, talk about some nuances to that. Talk some speed training, strength training, uh, exercise selection. We were just bitching and moaning before the podcast started about silly exercises. So I'm sure we'll get into that at some point. Um, first things first, uh, you know, for all the listeners, Alex, tell them a little bit about kind of yourself, where you're from, how you got into, how you got into research and uh, we'll kick it from there. Yeah, sure. Um, I'd say most of it stems from being a failed competitive golfer. Um, I, I was a fairly good junior golfer, got a scholarship to play division one golf. Like most golfers that play in college, they thought I was going to turn pro. Um, majored in kinesiology, thinking maybe it'll help me learn about the golf swing or something. And, and worst case scenario, I go to, I don't know, go to graduate school or something and Learned pretty quickly. I wasn't good enough to play professionally. So I uh, was actually planning on going to physical therapy school um, and then just kind of fell in love with the exercise physiology side of things. So stayed on for a master's and that's uh, got the chance to do a lot of research, work with a bunch of people uh, kind of on the clinical end as, as well as with athletes. Um, spent a year or two just Figuring out what I wanted to do was teaching as an adjunct professor, teaching anatomy and physiology. I was working with golfers and soccer players, a little bit of clinical stuff, uh, and then went on and, and did a PhD at Old Dominion University and happy to say I graduated as of two months ago. Uh, mm -hmm. So right now I'm I'm just uh, I'm just started new job as an assistant professor of exercise science at North Carolina Wesleyan College. Uh, and I'd say a lot of it just comes from I didn't get all that great of information as a competitive golfer. So I kind of started posting to social media as a way of, hey, here's stuff I wish I had known um, when I was competing. And then it turned into I might as well start studying it as well more formally. Uh, so started doing some research with golf and love it. So that's what I'll be doing kind of moving forward. Like you called yourself a failed pro golfer. <laughs> yeah. That's how that's 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 how all of us like I I feel like I'm a failed amateur golfer. I don't it's just I, I tell people my my first drive, I was a really short hitter uh when I came into college and then started working out and gained some distance, and that's kind of part of what got me into it. But uh I walk up and my first tee shot as a college golfer in a tournament, smoked it down the left side. Uh guy tees up that right after me hits at 60 by me and i've got a you know four iron into this par four and he's hitting a nine iron or pitching wedge and realized all right this is a little different i need to do something about this um not gonna last long out here man that, that's awesome that must have been like yeah just demoralizing you get up you hit the perfect ball and then you're like oh my god what am i getting <laughs> yeah. into yeah welcome to the show it's, it's kind of how it felt it's like that video of Tiger Woods and Justin Thomas and Tiger Woods like looks at his ball and he's like, Oh, that's not mine. Like keeps walking <laughs> past it to the next ball. Uh, that, that, that would hurt. That would hurt the team in a lot of ways. Um, so what let's, let's start with this. Where is your research at right now? So obviously you've done some stuff in the past on club head speed and strength training. Um, but kind of what, 
what have you done and kind of where, where are you going now? Um, or what are you interested in going into now research wise? Yeah. So as you mentioned a little, a little bit ago, there's really not many people actively studying golf performance, especially not in the strength and conditioning or nutrition side of things. Um, so everything I had done as a PhD student was largely like when I had free time, just because there's not many people actively pursuing it. Um, so a couple of the things I did was I did kind of a series of systematic reviews, which just really rigorous review of the research. And, and then a lot of it was that, you know, I had not heard of a lot of the papers that were out there when I was a competitive golfer. So there's some information out there. We might as well summarize it and kind of give us a baseline to work from. Like the literature base is pretty, like we don't have that much information compared to other sports, but we do have some. So let's figure out where we're at and then we can build from there um, and kind of fill in with the gaps from other sports and more general sports science knowledge and until we get to that point. Uh, but now that I'm graduated, COVID kind of put a damper on what I was going to do for a dissertation. Uh, I was going to do a deep dive into uh, what I call weighted implement training, but what most people refer to as overspeed training in golf. But the idea of using slightly lighter or slightly heavier clubs to kind of the specific aspects like super speed uh, kind of target. So I was going to do a deep dive into that. Uh, COVID shut down our lab. So I uh, ended up kind of having to change topics and do uh, a project that I could do completely virtually. Um, so kind of worked on some of the stuff my advisor does with uh, endurance athletes. But now moving forward, we just submitted, I teamed up with a few other people in the area, some of the other few that actively study golf strength and conditioning. Uh, so Chris Bishop, who's really big strength and conditioning researcher in England, and then some of the European tour performance uh, folks. Uh, we just teamed up on a paper that's kind of a, a review paper with more of a practical mindset for coaches. Um, and then once my equipment is up and running, just ordered a bunch of force plates and, and fun stuff. I'll have some studies kind of up and running uh, with that. So we can get into that more, more in depth as I'm sure. Probably will, no doubt about that. Absolutely. Now, what uh, I, I was looking at at your systematic reviews you've done, and I'm curious. Before we get into club head speed, you you did one on warm ups, right? So dynamic warm up. Uh, I'm curious. I, as physical therapists, we think of dynamic warm ups kind of as the you know do some lunges, get your body moving through full range of motion, get the blood flowing, and warm up. I think when golfers think dynamic warm up, they're thinking I got to get to the range and hit a bunch of balls to warm up and loosen up. Did you find any distinction there between uh, between those two different activities? Yes, yeah, so that was that was kind of a tricky thing when writing that paper is because I, I realized quickly I had to use the term physical warm up to kind of differentiate the non golf specific um side of warm-ups and so part of that review it was kind of three pieces it was it was summarizing the research on what golfers actually do to warm up so some of the surveys about warming up um and then there's a piece on the few studies which we don't have much on kind of injury risk uh related to warming up and then the performance side of things uh how it affects club head speed distance things like that um with the survey piece by far the most common warm ups done and, and any golfer will know this is air swings, meaning some a few practice swings then to the to the first tee, maybe a few static stretches for a few seconds and then hitting balls. Um, it, it's pretty rare to see, especially recreational golfers doing much in terms of like dynamic stretching, things like that. Uh, I think it's getting better, um, but still pretty rare to see that on the range. Um, but yeah, so the, that first piece really showed that, you know, golfers really don't follow the protocols that we see in other sports in terms of dynamic stretching. And, um, so, and then when you look at the performance side of things, there's been a few studies, quite a few now that adding dynamic stretching, adding resistance band exercises, uh, maybe some potentiation like explosive jumps, uh, those all outperform just doing air swings or hitting balls alone. So you get added performance benefits on top of that. You also looked at some of the stuff too, in terms of static stretching, um, in terms of performance. And I think some of it was showing that like, even people that just like did some statics, they did something 
outside of swinging before did have some improvements, especially if it was something that made them feel quote unquote looser or more ready to go hit. I know I'd read something of yours about that specifically, because we talk a lot about static stretching versus dynamic movement in every other sport in terms of the ability to produce more force, the ability to make an injury, uh, things of that nature. But I know there was, it was a little closer in golf than maybe other sports might show. Yeah. When it comes to static stretching, it's, it's kind of a, it, it seems like the pendulum's really swung on that. It used to be, that was an essential part of warmups. Um, then it kind of swung to, there are a few studies showing static stretching reduces strength and power. And then even a, there's been a couple papers in golf specifically that found that club head speed, distance, accuracy, all decreased after a static stretching routine. Uh, the point that's worth making though, is that's when you're doing a pretty extensive amount of static stretching. So that was like a 20 minute static stretching protocol, (laughs) like three sets of 30 seconds with each muscle group. And in more of the general like strength and power uh, research, it's largely when you're doing a lot of static stretching where it tends to affect your ability to produce a lot of force. Um, So I tell people, and and there's even been one study in golf where if there are any negative benefits from doing a little bit of static stretching, doing dynamic stretching on top of that or other methods seems to kind of wash that out. Um, so static stretching doesn't have a massive benefit when we compare it to dynamic stretching or other more recommended protocols, but if it makes a golfer feel better to do a few quick static stretches, they feel looser. I mean, you have to consider that piece of it and, and it may be worth including a couple quick stretches in, um, but yeah, whenever possible, I try to push them away from the really extensive static stretching to more dynamic movements, uh, resistance based warmups, things like that. And Tim, you can talk to this too. I don't have any golfers I work with that stretch that long at all. Yeah. They either do nothing, they show up and play, or they show up, hit half a bucket of balls, and then go play. Like I don't, because we there's so much demonization of static stretching, which again, from a research perspective, is true, and I don't we don't encourage it. But certainly, most people aren't doing 20 minutes of static stretching pre going to the course. You know, they might do. My favorite is when they grab like three or four clubs like they're baseball players and they're like swinging it like that's a, that's a hell of a way to warm up right there let's go bombs ahoy like mo vaughn from the uh, late 90s on the red Sox. <laughs> yes swinging three big three big barrel bats yeah no i and it's funny because you'll ask i'll ask some of my clients what you know what do you do before the round They're like well i know i should stretch but i don't do anything i just take and that's always an interesting conversation to have with them I'm like well you know, maybe we should, you should do something, but maybe we should build something else in, you know, the, the stretching isn't going to be the, the linchpin there. Yeah. It's always tough. Cause yeah, you're right. A lot of the time, more often than not, it's getting them to do something at all. Um, and that's probably going to be better than what they're doing. Um, but yeah. And the other big thing is they don't want to be the one on the range that's doing all these crazy looking dynamic stretching when their buddies are showing up at the last minute taking their clubs out and going straight to the first tee. So uh, there's some barriers to getting golfers to adopt um, some of these warmups. So it's probably going to be baby steps at first and then get what you can and then kind of hopefully start breaking down some of those barriers over time. Yeah. That's, that's the other thing I hear too, is like, I, I'll do some of the, I'll, I keep a resistance band in my bag. So I'll do some lunges and some pull up bars and just get things going. But d- maybe to avoid that i've suggested to a couple people do something at home and then get in the car maybe you're driving 20 minutes or 30 minutes to the course do you think that's a that's maybe a way to get around that that kind of anxiety around people looking at you doing weird stuff yeah ideally there would be a gym on site or something go do it in the gym and that's what a lot of the tour pros do and then then go out to the range and take care of the golf specific stuff but yeah worst case scenario if it's a short drive do something at home yeah maybe some of the benefits wear off but it's still better than not doing it at all um i i used to do in the locker room a lot of the times at college tournaments probably because i was the same way i mean i didn't want to be the one person out there doing lunges and squats and jumps and stuff. So I used to just find some quiet place to go do it. Um, so something like that. And, and really all it takes is, you know, five minutes, you can get a lot done and then go out and hit some balls and you're ready to go. So it's so funny that that's taboo in golf. Cause uh, so I came into golf late later in life. Like I played every other sport, every other sport warms up on the field. 
like football, you're on the field. And, like we're not in the locker room, like doing jumping jacks. Like you do, like, I'm not going to go do jumping jacks when I play football today. Like I got to throw a football, you know, baseball, same thing. Like everybody warms up on the field, but golfers, it's like, ah, uh, you know, you shouldn't, why, why would you want, it's the fun. I just think the difference between those is so funny to me. Like, oh my God, you're squatting. What do you, are, are you really stretching before you play golf? Be like, yeah, bro. I'm about to swing this club a hundred miles an hour. Get off me. <laughs> It's funny. And I mean, it, it really feeds into some of the misconceptions when it comes to training and golf as well. It, it yeah. Golf is, is very odd in that in some ways I wonder if like golfers are so desperate to like not forget that the skill component is really important that they like feel the need to completely discredit the role of being like physically fit at all. So it's, it's like, it can be both. Like it can be a skill-based sport that also also benefits from, you know, being prepared physically. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an odd sport and very slow to change. Uh, I think for a lot of reasons. So um, that makes it tough to adopt new practices and, and more of the stuff that sp other sports have been doing for decades. Uh, golf has been slow to adopt. Do you find that I'll call it younger generations are more receptive to that right now than maybe say to boomers and, you know, beyond that. Cause that's, you know, that is something that I see more of is even the guys that Tim and I work with. Like I have some guys that are, you know, in their sixties and seventies. And then I've got some guys that are in their twenties, thirties, forties. And I find that my younger guys are like, yeah, like I want to get after it in the gym. I want to look good. I want that to help my game. And my older guys are like, oh, uh, you know, whoever stretches like Jack Nicholas didn't stretch. Like these guys didn't work out like they didn't get strong. And you know, do you find or have you found any research on just the difference in age and or at least the younger generation being more open to those ideas? I don't know if any research, but just my experience would say absolutely yes. And And, and I think a lot of it, like you said, it has to do with we're slowly changing it at the top level where. I would still argue a lot of the practices, even at the top level, probably aren't optimal. But, you know, most junior golfers are coming up, looking up to the Rory McIlroy's, the Bryson DeChambeau's. All of those guys now are in the gym doing something. Uh, and I often talk about it. This generation of pro golfers is definitely in the gym way more than previous ones. But where I think the biggest change is going to be is when you have the next generation that's been in the gym training with coaches from the time they're 12, 13 years right. old um, and just everyone's training. And then you're going to have an entire generation of, of golfers that are very different physically than uh, even the current crop as impressive as they are compared to maybe even previous generations when it comes to the gym. Um, so yeah, I think future generations, that's where we're going to, it's going to get interesting, I think, because that's going to be more of the expectation uh, instead of just kind of the exception to be in the gym. Unless you're John Daly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could talk about John Daly, but, uh, but everyone, everyone talks about John Daly, not being an athlete. Um, I think it's almost more impressive that he, <laughs> he can do the things he does, but, um, yeah, I, I, John Daly gets, gets used as an excuse for not being fit in golf a lot. I just think people focus on the wrong aspects of fitness when, when we talk about John Daly. Like, <laughs> the most hypermobile dude in the land. I say hypermobile loosely. I'd like to see most golfers get into the positions he does and, and produce the amount of power he does. I mean, he, he's an impressive athlete, whether he's he's uh, living up to the the gym side of things is a, is a different story, but <laughs> – He's Natural idol, athleticism so. still good. <laughs> oh, I like it. I like it. Uh, anything else on that on that topic? I also did you guys see that JT is auctioning off all of his swag from the Ryder Cup, like his shoes, those like We the People shoes. He's auctioning them off. I didn't no. even want to go look at the price tag because a part of me was like, I'm going to buy those. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know how much money I got in my bank account right now, but it's worth it to have those shoes. <laughs> No, I didn't see that. What like a flag? If, is he doing that for charity or something? Some for some cause? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I think there was. I saw like his shoes. There was like his bag. Uh, there was a flag that was signed by all of the Ryder Cup guys. Uh, there's a couple other things. All I care about was his shoes. His shoes were fantastic. They were, yeah, best shoes of the weekend for sure. Oh, without question, the caddies were the best though because they held like the USA socks and the whole. I was, it was fabulous. Fabulous. 
anyways, I digress. <laughs> no, I did. I did see uh, JT. I was listening to an interview with him today, and he said uh, he knew they were going to win when Friday night, or yeah, Friday night. Bryson and Brooks were in the weight room at nine o'clock getting a workout in together, talking to each other. So I was like, "Oh, interesting." It's, it's all a crock of crap in my mind. <laughs> like I, th- I think they're, these, they're they're both Hollywood. They're like, "Hey, let's 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 get these people all riled up. Let's get the Europeans thinking we hate each other, and then we're going to show up to the Ryder Cup and just beat the brakes off of them. They're not even going to know what hit them, and then they'll sure. realize we're best friends." Sure, seemed like they were getting along pretty well at, at the Ryder Cup, but. I guess winning does does a lot though. When you're playing well, it's it's a little easier to be buddy buddy. Their hug was awful. It's awful. Yeah, uh, I, I don't want to bash anybody, but yeah, Bryson's got to work on his celebration game. He's kind of like a Phil. He's like a Phil celebrator. Like a couple guys went in for high fives and daps, and he it's just like. Uh. I mean, to be fair, do you know of many golfers that, I mean, other than Tiger, he's probably the only one that is uh, consistently good when it comes to the celebration game. Justin Uh, Thomas was solid. Yeah, he can can get after it. He was was getting juiced. (laughs) It's like, let's fucking go! Yeah, baby! I mean, other than that, you're right. Everyone's, I think it was, it might have been Cantlay. He did like the two thumb, like, oh, good job. (laughs) Like, that was, that was really terrific, guys. Hey man, that's that's what you get. It, you know, they're they're awkward white guys. What what are you gonna do? You can't ask for much. Yeah, more. but like, do your homies do that when you play golf? Like when we play golf, where maybe it's because I play with a bunch of athletes who played other sports all the time. Like they're like fired up. Like you're chest bumping. You're just like that was a great freaking birdie. Let's go, baby. <laughs> Come on. Like in golf, I just don't see it, and I would love. I would love to see more of that. Like Shane Lowry was the only guy that did that this past weekend, right? He made that putt on 18 and he was fired up. He was. He was he was getting after it for sure. Do you, get, do gotta... you get excited, Alex? Are you are you an excited guy? Like do you like smoke something and you're like you're like uh, do you do the fill? Or are you just like <laughs> let's go? Come on, baby. You know, most of my memories of competitive golf were more the uh, the anger side of things. I, I had a <laughs> little bit of a temper when I played, and I've oh. toned it down since then. But uh, oh, that's too bad. Yeah, <laughs> so that's what makes golf so interesting to me is watching people. Did you guys ever see that video of? Uh, <laughs> it's like the guys like we're playing a game of. Uh, I think they called it calling it. Excuse my language. A game of fuck shit. And the guy is videotaping and he he's like, hey, guys, we're playing a game of fuck shit. And he turns it to his buddy and he like hits it and just slices it. And he's like, fuck, shit. <laughs> oh, fuck ass. That's what it was. Excuse what? my language to all the people out there. We'll bleed it out for you. The funniest, because that to me is golf, is watching people just get so angry and so mad that they suck at golf. And I think that's what makes golf so fun. Definitely. Definitely. Well, let's, uh, should we move on to club head speed? Let's do it. Let's do it. What, uh, so Alex, you mentioned you're, you're working right now on a, a framework for club head speed. Tell, tell us a little bit about, uh, about that. Yeah. Sorry. The dogs are barking. I, I don't know if, uh, you can hear that in the background. You're but, all right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So for, I originally kind of started, I got really interested in, club head speed and kind of the physical attributes that uh, kind of contribute to it. And then I led to the meta analysis where I kind of pulled all the data from the research we do have on uh, which physical attributes are correlated with club head speed and to what degree. Um, so that's that paper got published. And then from there, it was kind of, I kept seeing these conversations where even my research was being used to say the only thing you need is strength. Or you get the opposite where it's like, well, this person isn't strong and they swing fast and it's someone that has great technique. And so my thought is, let's try to look at the entire picture and and actually kind of break down uh, from the underlying mechanics of where can we actually improve club head speed and, and what pieces kind of come together to help you swing fast. And from there, and none of it is groundbreaking, and it's largely based off what people have been talking about for a long time in researching. But 
just kind of showing it in one nice visual of where are the different areas that can actually contribute to swinging faster. Um, so I posted a, a picture a while back and I'm kind of expanding on it, but uh, a lot of it comes from uh, Sasha McKenzie's recent paper, just because I think he did a good job of framing um, some of the factors that contribute to it. And then I've kind of expanded on that, but um, that you guys want me to just dive into it or, or? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely just the factors. Yeah. So, and, and a lot of it is just coming from, let's understand the actual underlying causes of club head speed or kind of the mechanical determ or determinants as uh, Dr. McKenzie kind of phrases it. But a lot of it is just, you know, basics of biomechanics. Um, but he found that the amount of linear work you perform during the uh, downswing was one of the stronger predictors of club head speed, at least in his sample of golfers. Uh, you could also think of it from the perspective of impulse, which we can go into, but both of them are the amount of work you do during an action or the amount of impulse you uh, generate are some of the stronger predictors of how well you do any sort of dynamic movement. And so just to explain that the amount of linear work you perform during the downswing, linear uh, work is largely a product of the amount of force you produce and the distance upon which you produce that force. Uh, and so when you're thinking about the golf swing, you can largely swing faster by producing more force during the downswing along kind of the downswing path. Uh, so Dr. McKenzie uses hand path since we're ultimately trying to get force into the into the hands and into the club head. Um, so the, how much force you produce during the downswing through that hand path and then the distance of your hand path, which gives you more force and, or more distance and more time. Uh, so think of this as having that high hands in the in the backswing, and then you have more time to generate force during the downswing. So it's kind of force and distance. And then on the force side of things, there's a few things that contribute. So one, it, how good are your muscles at generating force and kind of uh, putting sequence in it into the downswing? So you can kind of think of the the purely physical side of things. How strong and powerful are you? Uh, and then also the technique components, how well can you actually sequence those muscle joints how, and muscles and joints? Uh, how well do you use the ground? Um, all of those different factors, X factor stretch, things like that. Uh, so more of the technique component of it. And then in the hand path length, you know, you can rotate the torso more to get uh, increase the distance. Uh, you could increase the hip rotation. So things like ro or letting that lead heel come off the ground. Um, you hear about that more often now, kind of the old school style. But if you have poor hip rotation, that's a way to get a little more distance in the backswing and rotate a little bit more. Um, so yeah, and then from there, it's largely like, what can we as kind of fitness, uh, kind of physical preparation side of things, what can we legitimately influence uh, and obviously the muscle kind of force generating capabilities, how much force can those muscles produce is going to be one of the big ones. Um, then you can break down even further is, is, are you having a problem with how much total force you can produce? So kind of the strength end of things, or is it an issue with generating that force during the time frame of the golf swing or more rapid force development? Um, but then even on the distance side, you know, it could be something like they're not flexible enough to rotate. And so they're, can't get a long enough backswing to you know maximize club head speed uh but we can get into that it's it's that's going to be a case of more is not always better um it's going to be figuring out if that's a limitation and going from there uh where the force side of things gets probably downplayed <laughs> quite a bit in golf um but yeah happy to defer it and, and go into any tangents based off of that no that that made me think of a video that was going around today i think the pga uh Instagram account posted it's a guy yesterday using one of those like long mobility sticks. He had his arms up over behind his head and he's like rotating his trunk and it looked amazing. The flexibility is incredible. But then you have to ask the question and we've talked about this in, in previous episodes. Can you control your limbs and can, you know, can use your muscles to, to control your arms and, and your torso through that entire range of motion so that you're not just, you know, one of those wacky, wavy, inflatable arm guys, you're actually, you know, you're actually imparting force using the ground, imparting force through your body into, into the club head and, and translating it. 
Yeah. And I think how I usually talk about it is like, again, it becomes such a black and white thing where it's like flexibility doesn't matter at all, or it's everything. Um, and really it's probably a matter of you need enough of it to swing how you want to swing. And then from there, it's like, you're good. Let's focus more on the, the force side of things if you're trying to hit it further. Um, cause I mean, like when they've done studies comparing, female and male golfers, the females tend to have more trunk rotation flexibility, which, so they're probably in a better place from the distance side of that kind of equation. But the obviously club head speed on average tends to be slower and it's, it's probably a product of the force side. Um, so just doing more and more stretching up until a point may be helpful if you're pretty poor on that side of things to start with. But then from there, it's, you know, getting the club, into that position at the top is only going to do so much if you can't produce the force to actually accelerate it on the way down. So, um, and in golf stretching has always been viewed as, you know, everything, at least historically. And, and there's been much less emphasis on kind of the force side of things. And then, and then my paper, which, you know, looking across correlations, our measures of force tend to be better predictors of club head speed than, than flexibility. I'll take John Rahm. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's shorter than, essentially everybody else for the most part. I mean, his swing is pretty compact and he's in the top four in driving distance. Yeah. And that's mass and strength, you know? So, yeah. I would not... guess if you tested his ability to put force into the ground during that pretty Ouch. short time frame, he's probably up there. I mean, he's a sure. strong guy, but he's not taking that giant swing that Bryson's taking. I mean, he's not getting anywhere near that distance hand distance specifically, and yet he can produce a lot of force. And he's, you know, Tim and I talk about this a lot, and Tim used the great example of, you know, if you don't have a ton of mobility, but you're really strong in that range of motion. I mean, that's what we teach people when it comes to rehab is it's great that you have all this passive range of motion or flexibility. It's great that your arm can get here, but is it strong from A to B? Is it strong throughout that motion? And in a golf swing, you're not only talking about the ability to produce force, but violent force. So can I be violent throughout that range of motion, essentially? How, how much can I sustain that? I'd almost rather personally have someone who they don't quite have a ton of mobility, but they are really strong in the mobility they have. And as we increase that mobility, I'm increasing it with their strength. I'm not just, hey, we're lacking I don't know, 20 degrees of rotation. We're just going to work on that and not producing force through that rotation. You know, for every other sport and for how we treat people on a rehab side and on a strength side, that's what we focus on. I think golf sometimes just misses that. But then we look at examples, you know, such as Rom and go, hey, his range of motion might not be all there, but the man can produce so much force, especially when we think about older golfers where I've got guys that can't turn at all. You know, they they get to a 50 percent swing and that's really all they have. So if they really want to see distance improve, it's literally all. Can we produce more force? Do, do you agree? Is that something that you would agree with? That's just something that, that we see and do a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point. And, and I think an important thing to kind of bring up is that, like, you, they don't necessarily oppose each other. So you, just right. because you're working on the force end doesn't mean you can't also address some sort of limitation in trunk rotation or something like that. But you're 100% right that, like, in Rom's case, yeah, from a physics perspective, he probably could increase that backswing length and increase his speed. But he's so good on the force end why would he he's already like he's already hits it further than most he's powerful enough that you know he doesn't he can still get a lot of speed and who knows what would happen he suddenly has to learn how to resync when resync with his swing with a completely different backswing so um yeah i think it's also a matter of like for him it's it's probably the right decision to just you know crush it on the force and keep the swing compact um and, and kind of go from there uh, others maybe lengthening the swing can help, especially when we're talking about trying to optimize swing speed versus like being good enough, uh, being long enough to compete can be a different conversation than, uh, you know, trying to get every last ounce of club head speed. Um, so that's, that, that's, and, and again, that's why it's these black and white conversations about it are kind of frustrating because it, it's a nuanced thing. The golf swing is complex. You you can swing fast without being strong, but being strong and 
good technique is probably going to be your best bet. And, you know, had a long swing and a lot of force and good technique. That's where you're going to get the absolute longest hitters out there. And most of the long drive competitors, you know, they're going to have big, long swings. They're going to have really powerful bodies. And then they're able to coordinate the swing and use the ground well enough to really maximize speed. So, you know, it's a lot of factors involved and, I think where we get tripped up is t- we, we tend to focus on one of them at a time sometimes and talking about them and, and try to put everything on that instead of kind of viewing the whole picture. Um, so if nothing else, that framework was like, Hey, here's the pieces involved. Like you can succeed by being really good at a few of these or the right combination of them. Um, it doesn't mean the other ones are unimportant. It, it just means that, you know, there's, there's, plenty of ways to get the job done, um, especially with something as complex as the golf swing. Are you in, in this framework, are you looking at all into which one of these factors potentially might like weigh, you know, weigh more than the others or matter more than the others, or is it more, these are just all the factors that go into speed. Yeah. At this point it's, we only have so much, like my paper on correlations gives us some idea that it seems like, you know, the ability to generate force is, is very important, at least when we're looking at simple correlations, which is, you know, you have 30 golfers, you score them on whatever, some measure of strength, a squat, one rep max, you measure their club head speed, that there tends to be a decent correlation between the people that can squat the most and the people that can swing the fastest. Um, probably more so than most simple measures of flexibility and and trunk rotation and things like that. But then I kind of mentioned in that paper as well, it's the way we measure flexibility probably isn't all that great as well. In a lot of cases, like, do we really expect your sit and reach score to correlate to how well you can, you know, (laughs) rotate during the golf swing? Um, So I I think I, I do want to really start teasing out where each one of these falls but i think ultimately the reality is going to be on individual basis where are they lacking what is their limiting factor to more speed and then and kind of attacking it from there i know that we approach that all the time as just in a general training conditioning sense is that so for somebody who does no power work at all or somebody who's untrained clients of mine for instance and tim can speak to this as well just getting them stronger and 10 to 15 yards immediately jumps up onto there. And that's within like a month, right? That's just a month of them doing basic training, no changes to their swing. Like they just get a little bit stronger. But what we found that Tim, you, uh, we talked about this it was last week or two podcasts ago. We were talking specifically about when do you introduce power training? Like when does that, cause that's person specific, but I do power with my 75 year old ladies and I do it. The ability to produce power is important in life in general. Um, but for some people, it's just not something I prioritize immediately because they have trouble with doing that. So do you have any takes on like when to start adding in power or what you like to start with first? Because we have some of these things such as like chest pass, vertical jump is one of our better predictors of you know distance and club head speed. Do you have ways that you like to approach that or thoughts on that? Yes. I mean, in general, I take a a mixed methods approach most of the time, which means I'm doing some combination of strength training and and more power ballistic training. The difference is probably going to be how much each one's prioritized. Um, And and I kind of talk about it as golfers tend to be really low on the strength end compared to the demands of the golf swing. So, I mean, when you were talking about it's a pretty powerful activity where you're trying to accelerate a club head to you know, in, so, in the pro level, 120 miles an hour or more in a very short period of time. Um, and, and why I like to emphasize strength with a lot of golfers early on is that, you know, it's there's pretty good evidence now that one, improving your peak force capacity, which is largely what strength is, what's the most amount of force you can produce during a given activity or into some sort of ex- external resistance, like a weight or a force plate. Um that tends to alone drive up how well you can generate force at earlier time frames. And then probably even more importantly, stronger athletes tend to respond well to when you start switching over to more power or kind of speed based training. So in a lot of ways, like you want that foundation of strength 
pretty early on because that alone, so an untrained individual can increase their power, the rate of force of development just by increasing kind of that engine size, that general strength. Um, yes, at some point there's going to be diminishing returns, but that's also going to set them up for more success uh, when you actually switch to more power velocity based training later on. So that, that's just my approach. I generally, especially with golfers that don't have a lot of training experience, if you can get benefits from pretty general strength training early on, not to mention all the secondary benefits that has in terms of probably injury reduction, just general robustness, health, um, getting them involved with general strength training as a bigger priority earlier on, and then kind of having phases where you introduce more and more ballistic or kind of speed-based training. Um, but again, it kind of comes back to what most other sports already do. They kind of structure their training with specific goals for what they're trying to improve. And then, you know, structure it over time to kind of get the outcomes they want. But in golf, we're not quite there in a lot of cases. Word of the day, robustness. <laughs> not sure if that's actually, if robustness is uh, the precise that term. Is, it is 100% like the right term. I'm, <laughs> I'm stealing that and using it from now on. Now on. But Tim, so he talked just a little bit about diminishing returns. Um, but one of the things that, that at least I see a lot is that we never even get to the point where people see diminishing returns, similar to like where a power athlete was. Like when I was a, or excuse me, when I was like a power lifter, there was a point where my strength just started to peak a lot and I was having to change up a lot of my programming, but that was really years of training. Like I got really, really strong and really, really good at stuff. And pretty rarely with my golfers, do I see them not getting stronger consistently? because we're just not doing enough for them where the nervous system is just like, I got this, like, I'm really, really good at this. And so, you know, Tim, maybe you can talk about that a little bit because I find that to be one of those things where to your point, Alex, the mixed approach is best. And you can really vary that across time. You know, I've got guys that might do the same, some of the same strength movements for upwards of like three months or two and a half months. And then we'll go into a different phase of, of their training, but they get strong throughout that time because it's not the only thing they're doing. Like they're golfing, we're working on their practice time. It's not It's not what they do. They're not strength athletes for performance, for what their sport is. It's an adjunct to it. And so I, I've i not yet really seen a lot of those diminishing returns with golfers. With other athletes, I see that a lot more. So Tim, do you, uh, I want you to talk a little bit about that because I think that's an important thing for listeners of this to hear is, you know, oh, I'm going to get to the point where I just can't get any stronger. And then what do I do? You know what I mean? Right. I think, yeah, I think that might be a problem that we run into in like five or 10 years, like Alex was talking about, as we get this younger generation that maybe started, started lifting weights or, or training when they're, I don't know, I started when I was 12. So if we have more of the golf, uh, junior, junior golfers at 12 to 15 starting to work out, then they get to maybe 25 or into their twenties. Uh, you, you may see more of that, but yeah, the lion's share of our clients, at least that, that we see in the rehab world, or even if they're not injured or in any pain, they haven't done anything for a majority of their life. Or, you know, 40 years ago when they were in high school, maybe they played football and did some calisthenics or, you know, something like that. So with, with the majority of the golf population, I think just getting started doing some general strength. And then I, I totally agree with both of you. I like to work in some power from day one whether it's just, you know, slamming a medicine ball or jumping as high as they can jump, you know, doing some, uh, some long jumps, broad jumps across the turf. Just, I think that part of it builds in some fun where, you know, it can, it can get monotonous and boring doing squats or doing lunges week after week. If you can, you know, throw a ball into the ground as hard as you can, or jump, you know, jump around and, and have a little fun. I think that that increases compliance for sure. Right. People, people are more willing to do it when it's fun. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of people just see the benefit from getting started. And I, I think it's important to know, like when we start seeing like a lot of these like studies and like the strength research, like when they're looking at athletes and they classify them as like strong versus weak. And a lot of these studies, they're talking about like getting to the point where you're squatting twice your body mass. How, like, so like when they classify a group as weak in a lot of these studies, it's 1.6 
uh, like times their body mass. And that's kind of on the stronger end for most golfers doing a legit, like, you know, 90 degree at the bottom, you know, squat at 1.6 times body mass. So I think a lot of golfers, they don't realize like how much strength how, to what level strength still has transferred to other events. And then when we're talking about it, I would argue golf probably is a, it's a slower action in terms of the duration you have to generate force. So I think strength probably matters more in golf, at least has better transfer than something like sprinting. Um, Cause like sprinting, your only contact at least a good sprinter is only contact contact in the ground for, you know, less than 0.2 seconds. So they've got a very short time frame to generate force. So, which means it's really more important for a sprinter it's that rapid force generation. How much force can you produce really early on? Where golf, I, I think we got carried away with this number of 0.3, which was basically the time frame of when the club goes from the top of the backswing until impact. But good golfers are pushing into the ground well before that. They lead with the hips. They lead with the lower body. So as the club is still going back or before the end of the backswing, the lower body is already pushing into the ground. So really that time frame is probably longer than 0.3 seconds. Some of my studies coming up, I want to tease out kind of where exactly, like what, if we were going to measure someone's force at a given time frame, what is probably like the best time frame to shoot for with golfers. Um, but it's probably in that longer range of, you know, half a second or longer, maybe even closer to 0.8 seconds or something. And in the scheme of like, athletic movements that's a lot of time to generate force so you can use a pretty good percentage of your max force if you have 0.8 seconds to produce um so i think in a lot of ways force probably has more transfer to golf than most people appreciate um but they see it as this really rapid event but um yeah just just my thoughts i guess no i think that goes I think, a bit into specificity too go, go ahead Tim. Yeah. no i think that's a great point because i've gotten into technique a little bit over the last year and really studying uh studying by bio, the biomechanics of the swing and you watch JT or you watch Adam Scott, they've already transferred their weight bef a lot of times right before they're even taking the club away. You know, they had, they haven't even, the club hasn't even started the backswing and they've already shifted weight and started rotating the pelvis. So you've got pretty much the full, full second or 1.2 seconds of, of the golf swing to, to generate force. Never mind people that have really slow back, like Morikawa. Because his backswing is not super rapid, you know, although we do see the ability to produce more force when you have a rapid, you know, eccentric component, so to speak. Um, but something I wanted to touch on a little bit there, too, was you talked about sprinting and some of some of the things you hear all the time is, well, I need to if I want to get better at power, I have to do really, really powerful things. But when it comes to golfers, it's also. I don't want to waste time in their training. You know, although I don't have to be specific to the golf swing, like Tim and I harp all the time, your exercises do not have to look like the golf swing. And most of the time, I don't want them to. I don't want you learning some new pattern because you're standing on a BOSU ball, holding a lacrosse ball in your mouth with a band attached to your hip and you're, you know, humping the air thinking that's going to really help you with your hip turn. But we also don't want to waste time doing powerful movements that you don't do well are going to take a long time to teach. We do that. So in football, this is one of our big things is should football players power clean? Should they hang clean? Should they snatch? Are the benefits of that outweighing the fact that it takes a long time to teach those things well to people? So in the golf world, how do you kind of look at, okay, what's the most, uh, it's subjective, of course, to the person, but what's the most effective way for me to get this person to be more powerful as opposed to, oh, well, you should just sprint because, you know, sprinting is what powerful people do. Yeah. So, I mean, this is where like understanding timeframes for generating force is really useful. So sprinting, there's a reason that strength matters a little bit, but it's not as clean of a transfer because the physical qualities involved with sprinting maximal speed. And really where we see strength matter a lot is kind of acceleration because that initial force to overcome inertia uh, is really important in the very early stages of sprinting, but top speed at that point, ground contact time is really short. Uh, it's it, the definition of a very fast stretch shortening cycle type of activity where we're talking about less than 0.2 seconds. 
so at that point it's it's rapid force <laughs> is is kind of the name of the game but the golf swing we're probably we're definitely in that kind of slower stretch shortening cycle end of things if not just downright long time to generate force so and there's a reason that like things like peak positive impulse and jack wells his his research his strongest predictor of club head speed was peak positive impulse during a counter movement jump so with a counter movement jump here you have kind of longer time periods to generate that force peak positive impulse is just force times time basically um so there's probably a reason that had a pretty decent correlation with club head speed it's probably a little more similar to the time the force time demands of the golf swing of how much force can you put into the ground over half a second instead of 0.15 or 0.2 like sprinting or, or drop jumps or something like that that are you know much more reliant on kind of the the rapid elastic components where the golf swing it's it's pushing putting a lot of force uh, through the system and in, in a little longer time period. So things like jumps, loaded jumps in particular, I, I'm a big fan of, um, obviously if you can do it safely. So I use trap bar j- uh, jumps all the time in my own training when I can, um, cause you know, that's a really good way of increasing impulse into the ground in a kind of a similar time frame as the golf swing. Yeah, we'll do that with, um, like a med ball where it's like, it is a quick short, but you have the med ball dip, throw it as high as you can. Um, same thing with like throwing backwards over your head, you know, some certain chest passes, things like that, just to produce it again, to your point, which I was trying to make a little bit earlier is that, is this even feasible for them to do? Can they do it? Can they produce force? Do they have access to the things like that? Like a trap bar jump. I might have five guys right now that can do that. Maybe. Yeah. And that's where even doing something like, so I think what, is completely unused in golf (laughs) for the most part is you know explosive strength training so and that sounds scary but i mean lighter loads at higher velocity is is probably pretty good transfer for something like golf and it's a good alex good way to progress from you know maximal strength training to something that's a little more emphasis on power um, cause if you're talking about peak power, that's actually produced during most strength training exercises, it's, it's at lower percentage of one RM at higher velocities of movement. Um, since, you know, power is not that at power, we can get into the biomechanics of power, but, and how it gets kind of abused and in practical speak quite a bit, how that term's kind of misused, but I mean, power is kind of the balance between force and velocity. Um, so an easy way to kind of generate more power during an exercise is progress to, maybe 50, 60% of one RM and try to move it quickly and that intent to move it rapidly. And even that is like a nice, once they have a movement that they're really comfortable with, kind of trying to have a a phase of training where it's a lower percentage of their one uh, one rep max, but they're trying to move it a little more rapidly. And then mix in things like medicine ball throws, some sort of jump they can do safely. Those are going to get you more on kind of the, the velocity end of things in a way that's still pretty good for transferring to the golf swing. Alex is validating my training. I did some of those yesterday. I did some back squats at 50, 50% uh, intent on speed. So I, I love it. Love I it. like it. What, how do you see uh, power being kind of mis, misused or mis, uh, I guess, defined uh, in the literature just around? Yeah. The, so there's been big arguments about it in the re- So the way, most people refer to power in the non-scientific community is basically referring to like someone that can generate a lot of force quickly. Um, So, you know, anyone that can move quickly can change direction quickly, can jump really high. They assume power is what's contributing to it. Power does matter, but when it comes to the actual kind of nitty gritty biomechanics. um, So like think about during a jump or a golf swing, your peak power is about a, a, fraction of a millisecond in terms of it's this instantaneous moment of when power or uh, force and velocity are kind of like optimized but in reality what contributes more directly to dynamic movements is something like impulse where it's how much force can you produce during the time frame of the movement so like that total force uh so in a lot of ways you'll hear biomechanists kind of shake their head when people refer to 
like a powerful athlete because really something like impulse is a more precise term. But then it's always that balance. Like, yes, if you're publishing a scientific paper, you should use, you know, power in the right terminology. But when you're just trying to get your point across to a golfer, so you'll hear me use the phrase powerful golfer all the time. And it's not that I mean the precise biomechanical terminology. It's, you know, you know that that's going to get the point across. We're trying to move quickly versus, you know, move slow under a heavy barbell. Um, yeah, so a whole nother story, but there's plenty of papers of biomechanists basically losing their minds about terms like explosiveness and power being used when it's not really uh, describing what's happening. Are you an impulse golfer? <laughs> Time to find out. Yeah, that is not nearly as sexy as are you a powerful golfer? I, I, I will. I can't use impulse golfer. Like I just like, like what's your impulse? I'm sorry. Imp impulse golfer makes me think that you just like make rash decisions. Like you just, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, you just like, impulsive. I'm hitting an eight iron no matter what I'm pulling it. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, I think there's a reason that one never caught on in uh, kind of the athletic community. Um, but yeah, I, th I think it is important. And, and I'm kind of in the camp of, yes, when I'm talking to other sports scientists, how I'll, the terminology I use will probably be different than if I'm talking to a golfer that literally doesn't care the, what the difference is between impulse and power. They just want to hit it further. So communication, depending on the group you're talking to, is pretty important. Definitely. Yeah, it goes. I've, I've been reading Nick Winkleman's book on uh, on cueing and coaching. And I think that that point speaks to being able to just describe and get your get your intent across to the athlete. So if you're if you're going to say something like, you know, impulse and they just have no idea what it means, but you say power and they get it and they move how you want to with the intent that you want and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, there's you a paper that kind of argued that point of like, well, that's why the term explode or in kind of athletic, obviously nothing is exploding. It's just that, you know, it, it gives a nice visual when you tell someone to explode off the ground um, or to be explosive. Uh, most athletes are kind of get what you're get, trying to get across. And same thing with being powerful, just with how it's being used in kind of popular discussions for a long time. But yeah, you tell someone to be impulsive into the ground it probably not going to get the response you want. It depends on the person, dude. I mean, you know, those people, you know, they have like the different types of pros who they're going to give you all of the data, your loft, the spin. And people are like, Oh, I freaking love this. Like that, like that engineer mindset where they're like, I just want to know like all the biomechanics and how much tape rotation I'm getting. And is my pelvis pelvic, or am I anteriorly pelvically tilted at a five degree angle? And is that perfect? And there's some people who are like, can I just hit the ball further and have a beer? Like there are those people that want to know some of those things like, oh, impulse. And then they'll come and see me and Tim and be like, you have no idea how good my impulse is. right now. <laughs> like, yeah, bro. Hell yeah. Impulse. Yeah. Yeah. What you talking about? <laughs> Too much. What else we got, Tim? Stuff. What else we want to badger Alex about? This is fantastic, dude. Honestly, I, these conversations need to be had in the golf community because it's even today, it's still not even with all of the golfers that we have on the tour. Everyone still looks at them and goes, well, they're pros. Of course they work out. Of course they're getting strong. Of course they do. They're pros. And that's that's a common rebuttal is why do I need to do that stuff? I don't need to you know, go work out and do that. And a lot of times it doesn't even do us a lot of good to tell them like, hey, first of all, you need to exercise for your health. You need to focus on your sleep for your health. You need to focus on your nutrition for your health. Like, do you want to play golf for a really long time? I'd recommend that maybe we focus on your health. And as although those things aren't sexy, they want to hear, I can drive the ball further. I'm going to have more range of motion. Hey, how do I get more shoulder turn? All every day, all I hear, how can I get more shoulder turn? How can I rotate more? If I rotate more, I'm going to hit the ball further, right? So th that's often a fight is in this way of, we want training to become more of a common part of golf. But they're like, well, I don't want to be Justin Thomas. I want to drink beer and have fun on the golf course, but I still want to hit the ball a long ways. And I think that there is some of that. It is breaking through, but that is one of those like big barriers. It's like, well, who cares what the tour pros are doing? Like, I'm not going to go make a million dollars this weekend. And so finding that that balance, I find to be psychologically a war sometimes. Yeah, that's that's tough. And I mean... And ironically, like the lower level golfers are probably going to be the 
the ones that respond more readily to a lot of this training because they're starting at a lower level to begin with. Uh, And the argument, I mean, I sometimes make, but, you know, it hasn't worked in terms of getting physical activity, you know, levels up across the country in general is that like, even if your club head speed didn't increase one bit, you know, engaging in strength training has enough health benefits alone that it's still going to be worth it. But yeah, people want that tangible kind of more fun benefit in a shorter period of time than kind of the, it may be a while before you see any sort of differences in, in kind of your long-term health or something like that. So yeah, getting people to uh, do what they need to do is, is always, always a tough conversation. And especially in a sport like golf that has kind of had long held beliefs and oftentimes misconceptions that are really common when it comes to training in the first place. Absolutely. What else we got, Tim? Good. That it? Those were all the questions I had. I I need to digest. I got a couple. I got to look into Chris Bishop now. I I think uh, Jack Wall. So yeah, Jack um, Jack Wells. He um, Jack Wells does quite a bit with the. I think he's over at the UK PGA, uh, kind of on the sports science education side of things, but. Uh, he works with the European Performance Institute guys quite a bit as well. Um, and then Chris Bishop is a really good sports science researcher that's, you know, has gotten interested in the golf side of things. So he'll be a nice addition to the the research. And um, so he'll he'll do some cool stuff and we'll probably team up on some projects down the road. I think a lot of the European side of things does a lot of research. Not that we don't do research here in the States, but that this is completely anecdotal. This is just from me looking from the outside. It just feels like there's a lot of research that comes out of European or UK labs. And in the US, there's like, you know, obviously Sasha McKenzie is here. You know, there's you. Um, oh, what's his name? Uh, the guy that does the golf science lab, Cordy. Um, but otherwise, everything that I read is from Europe. So I don't know if it's just not something that's researched here as much because we have plenty of research here on every other sport. There's uh, sports science in, in a lot of cases is studied more often in England and Australia. It's a bigger priority at, you know, the university level. Uh, I'd uh-huh. say a, most like exercise science departments are going to have a really strong emphasis on more the healthcare side of, of exercise. And it makes sense. A lot of that is what's getting right. funded. Um, so, you know, if you want federal funding, you're going to focus on, you know, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, something like that. Um, and then golf in particular, I'd say the U.S. has a lot on kind of the sports psychology side of things in the U.S., yeah. but you're right. There's really – well, first off, there's only a handful of people across the world that really study strength and conditioning for golf, but a lot of them have stemmed from England, and part of it, I think, has to do with some of those universities study sports science, and so they got a few people that happen to be golfers too. And then with the European Performance Institute, um, the European Tours Performance Institute, they have some good people there that are really interested in doing research in addition to working with golfers. So uh, that's probably part of it. But uh, I would like to see more in the United States because there's really not a whole lot of work being done. Be awesome if we would listen to all that research. To your point, we spend a lot of money on research for healthcare purposes, like what happens with diabetes and heart disease. A lot of research into it, a lot of good info. And yet here we are with what, 1,600 people a day dying from heart disease. It's a, a conundrum. Yeah, that's one of my interests as well as why, and not so much diabetes specifically. It's not my area, yeah. but in, in golf, you know, where is the breakdown occurring? Um, And and I think there's probably a few places. I mean, there needs to be more research done and very practical research, I think is going to help with it actually being implemented. Uh, Definitely need more people getting the word out there about the info we have, whether it's in golf or other related sports that still applies. Um, But then obviously, you've got an uphill battle in golf with just some of the beliefs that have been out there for a long time. And, you know, some of the information that's been passed around historically that you also have to overcome that as well. So, but I think even in healthcare, like the average time it takes for like some sort of finding to be implemented in practice is like 20 or 30 years in most Mm -hmm. cases. So 
you know, it's a slow process and we need to find ways to do better. Can't argue that. That's a, that's a, that's a whole other podcast and a rabbit hole right there. You want to see Tim and I get real fired up about healthcare. That's the, <laughs> that's one of the fastest ways to see us get fired up about healthcare. Big time. Get me fired up thinking about it right now. Shoot. <laughs> I ain't got time for this. Tim, anything else? Anything else we got for the good, the good doctor? No, I think I think that was awesome. I hope uh, I hope the listeners absorb absorb uh, all the all the great info Alex threw out there. And uh, yeah, I appreciate all the work you're doing, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. No doubt, you guys can follow him on the socials on Instagram, golf underscore physiologist. He is everything he puts out is gold. Everything that's new, it's good info. It's stuff you should know. You can digest it. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to read it. Um, you know, guys like me and Tim, I mean, that's one of the ways that I've learned a lot about the golf side of things is through the stuff that you put to your point. It's just getting info out to people so that they can see it, um, and digest it and go, okay, I can make a better decision now based on that info. So I'm not wasting time doing 60 minutes of stretching. I'm spending maybe more time doing this, you know, making it less taboo to do strength training and, uh, I think that that is, you know, you're doing God's work in terms of the of the golf community there. But it, dude, for real, that makes a big difference because every other sport, that's what it is. Tim and I always complain about golf's the only sport where it's called golf fitness. It's not golf performance. It's golf fitness. Like I'm not a basketball fit. I'm not baseball fit. I'm not football fit. Like everyone be like, excuse me, you just call me fit. I'm like JJ Watts, not fit. His brother is certainly not fit. like they're animals. Like I would love to see golfers start to get some of that mindset where they're like, yeah, like I'm just a a yoked ass golfer who's strong, who can compete and play and have some fun. Yeah. And I I think we're in an interesting kind of time. And when it comes to golf, because I think we probably do have a receptive audience when it comes to the younger golfers that are, you know, they're seeing what Bryson's doing. They're seeing that Brooks and, and a lot of those other guys have been succeeding while lifting heavy weights. And um, so I think there's really an opportunity to get good info out there and kind of push the industry forward a little bit. Um, so if I can contribute to that in some small way, I'm happy to do it. Absolutely. Word. All right, peeps. Well, give him a follow. As always, you can find Tim and I on the socials. Timothy, I always, it's it trevoto.trevoto.golf. Did I say, yeah. I, did I, did That's I get it. it right? That's it, yeah. trevoto.golf. It's T Revoto, first of all. You'll have, I still have you in my phone as <laughs> Tim Trevoto, but that's that's fine. You can find me at jackson.anchorforge. Uh, follow Alex, stay on top of it, keep getting strong. Oh, also, shout out my guys, Two T's Golf Company. Just sent me this baby from Wisconsin. Those guys are dope. Go check them out, Tim. You need a good hat in your life. It's a nice hat. You're right. I'm the only one without a without a good hat. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. How about you play catch up? You know, Alex looks good over here. He looks like he's ready to go play 18, and you look like you're about to have a baby. So, <laughs> well, it is what it is. Both of those things are true. Hey, it's all good. All right, people. Well, we appreciate y'all, and uh, have a good weekend. That's it. Peace. Deuces.